Uh, yes. <laughs> All right, so the second lecture, let me start with something um, which I didn't mention explicitly, namely why, why are we talking only about overlaps of scalar products between these points? Because you can imagine the Hamiltonian is defined on these vectors with coordinates plus and minus one, you know, and this fact that the coordinates are plus and minus one, it can play a role, and it does play a role in many models. But in the shared Kirkpatrick model, um, all the information is encoded by the overlaps or by the scalar products. And there is a very simple reason behind this because when you look at the Hamiltonian of the SK model, we define it to be this Gaussian process. Okay? And notice that for convenience, now I, I'm, I'm changing the definition a little bit. I will include sum over all i and j instead of i, you know, pairs of i and j, which really does not change anything. And a Gaussian process, its distribution is completely described by the covariance function. So if you compute the covariance function of this Gaussian process, you will see you know, in, in one line that this is just a function of the overlap. It's a square of the overlap times the size of the system. So for this reason, the distribution of this Hamiltonian is invariant under orthogonal transformations. And so, our configuration space, individual coordinates do not matter at all. Only the scalar products between them encode all the information. Now, there is this whole class of models with the same property called pure p-spin and mixed p-spin models. So pure p-spin model is the exact analog of the Scheer and Kirkpatrick model. Only you allow interactions between p coordinates at a time instead of two. So you will sum over products of p-coordinates with this, the same independent Gaussian interactions. And you will introduce slightly different scaling for the same reason as before. You want to keep the um, Hamiltonian of order linear with them. And mixed p-spin Hamiltonian is just a linear combination of these pure p-spin Hamiltonians. And if you compute the covariance of this process, you will see that it is, again, a function of the overlaps. In fact, the covariance of the pure p-spin is just the pth power of the overlap times n. And mixed is just will give you some linear combination. So these are also functions of the overlaps. And for this reason, anything you can prove about a SK model, you can almost always automatically prove in this whole family of models. But this family of models is also uh, very important for technical purposes, even within the SK model. We'll see that this will pop up again near the end of the talk, that when you prove Guerre guerre identities, you use these models to prove that. Okay, so let me remind this ultrametric um, clustering tree that I described. The only difference now, I'm completely switching to talking about overlaps instead of distances, so now, we discretize the overlaps, and the overlaps increase in this direction. So otherwise, everything is the same. If you pick two points, and you pick points in, the, in those two clusters on the leaves, you, if you trace where they merge, that tells you more or less what the overlap between these points is. And I mentioned that um, the probabilistic part of the picture is that there, there will be some royal probability cascades that will describe how these weights the Gibbs measures of these clusters can be generated. Now, this real probability cascades description is, is pretty simple, but first we need uh, one object. Um, uh, so the object will be called Poisson processes. We look at a very special family of Poisson processes uh, indexed by this parameter A on 0, 1. And this will be a Poisson process with the mean measure on a uh, positive half line given by this density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, A, X, minus 1, minus A. So it's some density that kind of blows up near zero, right? Now, if you have seen Poisson processes before, this already gives you the definition, what this process will be. Okay, it will be some random countable collection of points on the positive half line. But if you haven't seen, the definition is very simple, okay? What you do is, 
first thing you do is you have to partition your space into sets of finite measure because the measure you have here is not finite, it's sigma finite. So you, you can cut it into pieces of finite measure any way you like. The final result will not depend on how you partition. So in this case in particular, we can partition taking a big chunk from one to infinity and because it blows up, you know, you can see it's not integrable here near zero. You have to cut into kind of smaller and smaller intervals. And then once you cut into uh, these pieces, what you do is first you generate a random number for each set. So these will be Poisson random variables nm with the expect where the expected number will be exactly the measure of that set. And the Poisson just means that it will take values. It will be really like counting something, 0, 1, 2, and so on. The probability that you see number j is just given by this formula. Okay. Now, once you generate these numbers, the last thing you do is on each set, now you will generate that many points from the probability distribution, which is just your mean measure restricted to that set, right? If you just restrict it to the set, it's not probability, but if you scale it by the weight of that set, that becomes a probability distribution. So you generate it now finitely many points on each element of this partition, and their union will give you this countable collection of points on, half, um, on positive half line. And that will be called Poisson process with that mean measure. Then the real probability cascades will be described in, term the, in terms of these processes, and they will also involve these parameters given by the probabilities that I will denote zeta p. It will be just the probability that your overlap is less than or equal than qp. So on this tree, you know, we have the axis here which measured, I mean, how you discretize the overlap. So these are the values. And so zeta p is just the probability that two points that you pick randomly will merge above that level. And then what you do is uh, the following. For each vertex in this tree above the leaves, okay, not on the leaves, but any vertex above the leaves, now you generate this Poisson process with that, that I just described with this parameter given by the probability at that level. And then you can enumerate uh, these points, you can arrange them in the decreasing order on the positive half line, and you can enumerate them like this in the decreasing order. And then what you do is you take these values and you distribute them among the children of that vertex. So now, and you do this independently for every vertex. Okay, so if you pick another vertex here, you do the same procedure independently from this vertex. So now you have a random number on every vertex in this tree, including the leaves, except for the root, because the, the number that you assign to the vertex, it's coming from its parent. So the root doesn't have a parent, so it will have no number, but everybody else will have a random number which came from its parent with these Poisson uh, processes. And then once you have this, the definition is very simple. So for each leaf uh, alpha, you just define V alpha to be a product over product of these numbers that you just generated over the path which leads from this uh, leaf vertex to the root. So you move, you walk along this path and you multiply all the numbers you generate. And the Gibbs weight of that cluster, that small cluster corresponding to this leaf will be just proportional to this V alpha. So it will be this V alpha divided by the sum of all the Vs. We have this very simple, very explicit construction how your weights of these random clusters will look like, and you only use this information, right? You are using really, again, the um, functional order parameter. The distribution of one overlap tells you exactly how these uh, weights will look like. Now, this object is really well studied. For example, you have other ways to generate these cascades, if you like, there is a procedure which will tell you how to do it recursively from the root down, you know, essentially telling you how to split the weight of a bigger cluster among smaller clusters. So you can do it in that way if you like. There's another way that you can just ignore the tree and generate the weights of 
leave clusters in one step, but then you have to explain how they merge, how all these clusters merge up toward the, the root. So there are many ways you can describe this. And one thing that you get from this precise description, I already mentioned that this allows you to have explicit computations. For example, the free energy formula just comes from, from these explicit computations. But it also, this, this very you know, precise prediction by the physicists, it also gave important ideas and motivation in the proof of ultrametricity. Which might sound a little bit strange because here, the real probability cascades, they, you cannot define them without having this ultrametric tree structure. It's a part of the definition in this object, but it turns out that you can study you know, the probabilistic properties of these Gibbs weights and you can discover some properties which do not refer explicitly to the tree structure, which turned out to be um, helpful to prove the, this geometric property of, of ultrametricity. Okay, so I mentioned that the proof of ultrametricity is based on these Guerlain de Guerre identities. And at this stage, I will just mention what these identities look like without explaining where they are coming from. And they look, this is a very, very simple property of your, of your random matrix that we define. So now I'm in the limit. So I'm looking at the asymptotic Gibbs distribution. If you look at n plus one points and you look at their overlaps, you have this random gram matrix of their scalar products. And it turns out that this matrix has the following uh, distributional property that if you show me, and if you reveal n by n block, right, then you, you say now generate one element in the last column, let's say the first one. So in probabilistic language, it means what I'm going to give you now is just conditional distribution of you know, that guy given n by n block. And you can generate it as follows. You just pick a number at random between one and n. If you pick a number from two to n, you set the value of this element to be exactly one of these values in the same row, right? So you just take whatever you, row, whatever column number you picked. And if you pick one, you, you ignore that diagonal element and you generate um, this new element from the distribution of one overlap independently. So in other words, it says that the conditional distribution of this guy will be a mixture of unconditional distribution and delta functions on the values you already observed. Okay? Of course, you can generate the second element in the same way, but what the Guerlain de Guerre identities don't tell you how to generate two of them at the same time, right? Because this whole column is, you know, it will be highly correlated and it just tells you what the distribution of each one of them will be, but not the joint distribution. And if from this information you can figure out the joint distribution that you solve the problem because you can reconstruct the distribution of this whole matrix. So this might look a little bit mysterious, but we'll see there is a very you know, nice physical um, property behind it, which can be described in terms of this energy uh, landscape. So what I'm going to do first is just describe various consequences of the Guerlain de Guerre identities. Okay. I'm going to be using this notation, so let me just mention it right away, that uh, notation for the Gibbs averages will be the angle brackets. So either when you are on a system of finite size, or if you're already in the limit on a Hilbert space, if you take a function on n copies of your space, the angle brackets will denote just the average of that function with respect to the product Gibbs distribution, and the same in the limit. Okay, so angle brackets, it will still be random because it will depend on the randomness of the measure, but at least you averaged out the, the Gibbs with respect to the Gibbs distribution. So when I talk about consequences of the Guerlain de Guerre identities, I assume that we are already in the limit. So identities themselves will, of course, emerge 
you know, first for a system of finite size based on the properties of your model. But when you pass to the limit, you will get these identities just by the definition of the limit. And so I assume that your Gibbs distribution on a Hilbert sp space satisfies these identities. And then as a consequence, well, I will start with a simpler one and kind of increase the difficulty. So the first statement will be that this Gibbs distribution will live on some non-random sphere. Okay? You have a random distribution, but it will always live on a non-random sphere of radius square root of Q star, where Q star is the largest point in the support of your functional order parameter, the largest value that the overlap can take. Okay. So in particular, if you write the distance between two points squared and you write them out in terms of scalar products, it can be written like that in terms of scalar products. So in the limit, you can continue to talk interchangeably about you know, distances or overlaps, right? If the distance increases between points, it means the overlap is decreasing. So, you know, um, you can talk about either one you like. Now, the second property will deal with two points now at a time. So, if you, this is saying that the overlaps will always be non-negative. If Gelander Guerre identities hold that whenever you take two points from your Gibbs distribution, they will, they, the scalar product will always be non-negative. This is known as Talagrand's positivity principle, but this is, again, just a, you know, a few line computation. So both of these are very basic consequences of the gelander guerre identities. And the second one is telling you that whenever you have gelander guerre identities, your system has a preferred direction, right? There is some kind of direction where all the configurations that you will see will be you know, in this cones that their scalar product will always be non-negative. Okay, so now we'll go to the, this main um, difficulty, ultrametricity, which deals with three points. So if you pick three points, um, I wrote before that the distances should satisfy the strong triangle inequality, but of course you can, you know, because of this relationship, you can flip that inequality to write it in terms of scalar products. So ultrametricity in terms of scalar product just means two smallest scalar products are, are equal. Okay, if you think about this, it just means two smaller scalar products are equal, or two largest distances are equal. So when you see three points, you will have you know, a triangle with two equal sides which are bigger than the third one, greater or equal than the third one. And so the main idea in the proof of this ultrametricity, um, and the one that was really the most difficult to discover was this invariance property that I will show now. So invariance property will tell us that the distribution of the overlaps is invariant under lots of different changes of density. And the property will look something like this, that if you take, uh, so take n by n block in your gram matrix of scalar products and take any bounded measurable function of, of that block, then when you compute the average of that function, the average with respect to all the randomness, right, with the Gibbs distribution and then the randomness of the Gibbs distribution, it will be equal to the average of this function times this quantity d, right? And before I even show you what this quantity looks like, the meaning of this statement is that that quantity d will act like a change of density. And moreover, the distribution of the overlaps is invariant under the change of density. Right? Now, the uh, changes of density, they are not uh, obviously changes of density. It's, it's also a consequence of, of, of the Guerre de Guerre identities, but they will look something like this, okay? They, it will be like a function of the overlaps, non-negative function of the overlaps in the numerator. In the denominator, you, you start with non-negative functions of the overlaps on the, you know, n by n block, and then you integrate out the last coordinate with respect to the Gibbs distribution to the power n. And the choices of functions d1, d2, it's not arbitrary. I'm not going to say what they are, but it's just some large family uh, of these pairs that you can choose, large family of admissible functions. And so, as I said, this invariance 
gives you an invariance of the distribution of the overlaps under some large family of changes of density. Now, one thing I want to point out here that uh, in this definition, the denominator depends explicitly on the Gibbs distribution. So it's not just a function of the points, it's also a function of the whole Gibbs distribution. So this denominator depends on the Gibbs distribution because you integrate. So um, that's kind of important. So let me show one example, how, just one simple example how this uh, property uh, can look like or what kind of information you can get out of it. So in this example, we consider a set of uh, n, so vectors of n points from your uh, support of your Gibbs distribution or on, on this non-random sphere where this Gibbs distribution lives. And by the way, let me say, just to avoid confusion, that from now on, when I write any sigma, it's always on, in the support of the distribution. So I assume that it's on the sphere. And um, for example, here, I, this set is uh, such that the scalar product of the first one with the other ones is less than some number. And on the sphere, it just means that this point is well separated from the other points. Right? Your scalar product is smaller than something, so these points are outside of a certain neighborhood of your point. And phi will be indicator of this set. Then let's take W to be a Gibbs uh, weight of this neighborhood of point sigma 1, which consists of all sigmas within, which are not too far, right? This is sigmas with a scalar product greater or equal than Q. So inside the, that neighborhood. So that will be a random Gibbs weight because your measure is random. And finally, gamma will be an average weight of such neighborhoods, average over everything, average over the choice of the point and the randomness of the measure, which you can also write as the probability that two points or the element of your matrix, this overlap is bigger than Q. So then the, this invariance property will tell you with some choice of these functions, admissible functions, that for all x on the real line, right, the average of this indicator, so the probability of such configuration, is equal to the average over that set of something like the change of density, but what you see here, you have explicit dependence on this random weight of that neighborhood of one point. And if you look at it a little bit, x is arbitrary, so you can send x to infinity, for example, in this case, and you see that this guy goes to infinity much slower than x to the x times n. So what does it tell you? It tells you, you know, if, if 1 over w to the n is integrable, this would become 0. So it gives some kind of constraint on how the weight of this neighborhood can behave. Okay? So the main point I want to make is that this invariance property, it gives you some very special relations on how the uh, overlaps behave relative to the weights of the neighborhoods, Gibbs weights of the neighborhood. So you get, uh, you know, by comparison with guillain guerre identities, you just had information about these overlaps. Here you explicitly incorporate some kind of uh, property of the G Gibbs weights of the neighborhoods explicitly. And so this is the property that uh, I discovered just by studying Ruel probability cascades. And as you saw, that property does not refer to the tree structure. You can formulate it for any, um, for any random measure on a Hilbert space. And of course, when you want to prove this property in a, like a shared interkickpatrick model, how do you prove it? You don't have real probability cascades. You try to prove that you have real probability cascades. But it turns out that once you discover this property, it follows very easily from the guillain de Guerre identities. In fact, the proof is, is very simple. What you do is you just introduce some interpolating parameter into the definition of this change of density. You put the t in front of these two functions. When t is 0, this just becomes 1. And you look at the average of your function um, with respect to this change of density with parameter t, 
as a function of t. And what you want to show that it, it does not depend on t. Okay. And how you show it, once you start computing the derivatives of this at zero, you will see that they all vanish. I mean, without any work, they just vanish immediately thanks to the Guillain de Guerre identities. Okay, so you get this, and you have a proper control of the derivative, so you get this invariance property whenever you have Guerlain de Guerre identities. Okay. So another important idea in the proof was not to go after ultramatricity directly, but to notice that the physics picture gives you something much more special than just ultramatricity. Okay? The picture gave you, I mentioned this before, that you know, not only you have this tree, but this is an infinite tree. And any time the cluster breaks into subclusters, it's supposed to break into infinitely many subclusters. Okay? So instead of pro proving ultramatricity, you, you should try to prove something stronger. And in particular, in this case, you will have the following property because of this. So if you take any points in the support of your uh, Gibbs measure, you see how their distances behave on this tree. And I pick one of these points to be a special point, like colored red. Then here, when it's separated from the closest black point, you had other directions to go to. So you can always pick this blue point um, on this tree, which I will call a duplicate of red point. So this blue, you can always find a duplicate of red point like this. And what I will mean by duplicate is that if you look at this picture, blue and red point are at the same distance from all the black points on this tree, right? On the tree, they, you know, they are at the same distance, like where the red meets with any other, that's the same place where blue meets with any other. But also, it's a non-trivial duplicate because it's not too close. You, you pick this point pretty far from this red point, like not here, but you went at least as far you know, as the closest among the black points. So what the Parisi solution predicts is that whenever you pick some configuration of points on your non-random sphere in the Hilbert space, and you look at you know, this set of points at the same distance from the black points as the red point, you take a large neighborhood of the red point, which goes up to the closest uh, black point. If you believe Parisi solution, you should always be able to find this blue point outside of that red neighborhood at the same distance from all the red points as the, from all the black points as the red point. So that's what I call a duplication property. And once you have the duplication property, you can easily see that it implies ultrametricity. So you could go after this duplication property and you will get ultrametricity as a consequence. Okay. Now, let me show this argument completely because this is very easy. This is very easy to see that if you can always duplicate a point with the properties I described, you can only do it when, you're, you know, when your measure is ultrametric. And to see this, you pick any three points you look at their scalar products, A, B, and C, and I suppose that C is the largest one. Among this three, C is the largest one. So sigma two and sigma three are the closest among these three points. And what I want to show that A and B are equal. Ultrametricity will mean that A and B are equal. Okay. What you do is you just start with these points, and you, then you duplicate them many, many times with these properties that I mentioned and look at the barycenters of these clouds of points. In other words, just averages of these um, uh, duplicates, and see how these averages will behave. And on the one hand, the scalar products between barycenters will always stay exactly A, B, and C, because any time I duplicated this point, I made sure that its scalar product with everybody else are the same. So, the scalar products in between the groups will always stay A, B, and C. But on the other hand, any time you duplicate a point, you, you never take it closer than the closest point, right? And the closest point we started with was at the scalar product C. So that means that any points, even within the same cloud, 
will always have scalar products not more than C. And now if you compute what is the barycenter scalar product with itself, well, imagine multiplying out those averages. Almost all the terms are at most C, except the scalar product with itself, but that just gives you a small correction. So the scalar product of barycenter with itself is not more than C up to a small correction. And now you see that these two properties tell you that second and third barycenter are getting closer and closer to each other because their scalar product is C, but their length is like square root of C, right? So that means that they are really almost the same point. And that, of course, implies that A is equal to B because sigma, the, the scalar product of second and third barycenter with the first, this is exactly A and B, but these two points are the same, essentially, so A, A must be equal to B. And moreover, you need it even in a weaker sense that the Parisi solution um, predicts, you just need to be able to duplicate a point with, even with positive probability. Like any time you see a configuration, uh, some admissible configuration, you just need to say that you can go one step further, right? And finally, you get um, ultrametricity from Gelanda guerre identities because this invariance property implies the duplication. And this is kind of a little bit subtle, so I'm not going to show the proof, but I'll tell you the idea that essentially it works by contradiction, that if you assume that you cannot duplicate a point of some admissible configuration. So in other words, you know, this configuration of points can be observed with some positive probability, but for such configuration of distances, you can never find a blue point, not even with positive probability. It turns out that such geometric constraint is ruled out by this probabilistic invariance property because it simply does not match, you know, I told you that this invariance property tells you something about the behavior of distances and the weights of neighborhoods. And in this case, you can see that the weight of this red neighborhood just doesn't match what's going on with those changes of density. And the only way you can correct that behavior is to put all the weight inside that neighborhood, make it equal to one. But that's not possible because you have some points outside of the neighborhood. So by contradiction, you get, you get this property. Okay. Okay, so the Gilanda guerre identity is, is this very powerful um, statement, as it turns out, which imply uh, ultrametricity, it implies the real probability cascades once you have ultrametricity. So now we want to understand what's, uh, to say a few words about where these identities are coming from. Because it looked a little bit mysterious if you just look at the, you know, that distributional identity, what, what does it really mean? Well, what is really behind this is a very basic, you know, statement that a Gibbs distribution is concentrated on some constant level of energy. What you will have is that for any temperature, you will have some constant that when you look at your you know, energy landscape, now I'm scaling it by n to make it of order, of order one, you will have some constant level here such that the configurations with energy in that narrow band will carry essentially all the weight. So all the weight will be within this narrow, in the configuration with the energy in this band. So if you remember, I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, I'm looking for clusters near the peaks here. These are the most likely, well, we're looking for clusters near the peaks. It turns out that you have to go a little bit, you know, it, it's not going to happen right near the peaks. You really have to go down to this level to pick up enough weight. And moreover, what is interesting is once you reach the level where you pick up weight, you, you can completely discard everything above. Those peaks are sort of narrow or small to give you any weight. Really, all the energy, all the Gibbs distribution weight will be within this narrow band. Okay. So that's what Gilanda and Guerra discovered. Now, it turns out that by itself, this is not, uh, I mean, what 
I, once I tell you in a second how you get Guerlain de Guerra from this, by itself, it's not enough to have this. It, it points you in the, in the right direction, that you start seeing, okay, it looks like those identities should be true, but something, you don't have enough information. Oh, by the way, before here, I, of course, also wanted to mention that if you let beta go to infinity, in other words, you, you know, weigh those high energy configuration more and more, what will have happen, of course, that this, you know, band will move closer and closer to the level of peaks. So at, at zero temperature, you will really see only, you know, one peak, so to speak. So to prove the Guerlain de Guerre identities, you, you, this is where this mixed P-spin Hamiltonian come in to, you know, help you out. So you consider this mixed P-spin Hamiltonians. And what you do is you use this uh, Hamiltonian as a perturbation of your model. Okay, you, instead of looking at the Hamiltonian that you started with, you just add this mixed P-spin term, but you, you make sure you add it on much smaller scale. So you multiply it by something like one over N to the gamma, it turns out you can take any gamma less than a quarter. So on the energy landscape, you don't notice this term at all in some sense. I mean, when you look at the maximum of this function, it's of order n. Now this guy is of order n, but you divide it, so this is of much smaller order. That perturbation is not noticed, you know, in terms of the free energy of the maximum. So having that perturbation does not affect the goal that we have, to try to under compute the free energy and the maximum. But what this perturbation um, allows you to do is that you can show that for some choice of these parameters in this linear combination, so in other words, you can choose this perturbation term in, in a special way, and that way can actually vary with n, but it doesn't matter because it's always in the perturbation term. You never touch your main model term, but you choose a perturbation term in some way so that not only the energy of your main Hamiltonian is concentrated, I mean, the Gibbs measure is concentrated on the um, constant level of energy, but also each of these terms, you know, each of the P-spin terms in your perturbation term, when you look at it on the, at the right scale, it also behaves like a constant. So where the Gibbs measure is concentrated also on the constant level of energy for each of these guys, for each guy in this term. And once you have this information, what you do is you simply express it by integrating against the test function. Okay, you, you pick a test, you pick any function of the overlaps, you multiply it by, this, by these energies you integrate it, and it should behave like that average of your function time a constant. When you write it down and integrate by parts, you know, it's a one-line computation, you will immediately see Guerlain de Guerre identities. So Guerlain de Guerre identities, it's a very, very straightforward computation using this property here. Okay. So what is really great about this idea that you actually don't work with your model, but you, you enforce or you force this Guerlain de Guerre identities by a small perturbation of your model, is that this perturbation, it works essentially in any model you like. It, it, the proof of the Guerlain de Guerre identities have almost nothing to do with the original Hamiltonian. It's a property of the perturbation. So there is a very mild condition, so in the Edwards Anderson or in many, many other models, you can get Guerlain de Guerre identities in a very soft way by, by this perturbation, and you get all the consequences as a result. Okay, you get this ultrametricity and real probability cascades just by a small perturbation of your model. Now, there is one thing that though Guerlain de Guerre identities do not tell you, uh, I said before that the identities imply almost everything in the physicist's picture, but not everything. And what they don't tell you is whether you have a phase transition, or more precisely, whether when you look at the distribution of one overlap, is it non-trivial or trivial? 
Okay? No, trivial here means that it concentrated on one value. You only see you know, one, one value of the overlap. And if you have, so to see that tree structure and real probability cascades, you can only see them when you have more than one value for the scalar product. So when the distribution of the overlap is not constant. Okay? Which of course is, it's even better in a sense. I mean, you shouldn't complain, it's just, uh, you know, Gilan de Guerre identities tell you that the worst thing that can happen is the Parisi solution. But of course you want to know what's going on. And when the distribution of the overlap is trivial, it really means you just see the root, okay? That tree just consists, consists of the root. So the distances between points in the limit will always be zero, okay? Or the scalar product will always be um, constant. And that's called replica symmetric solution. So in the sharing the Kirkpatrick model, that piece of information is coming from the Parisi formula. Because you have, because we computed the formula for the free energy, we know that this parameter is exactly that distribution of the overlap. So when you minimize, you find that minimizer. You can see, because this is just an, some analytic you know, property, I mean, some analytic problem that you are solving. So you can see that the minimizer is non-trivial for uh, temperatures less than one, so for beta bigger than one. And so in the sharing to Kirkpatrick model, you really know that at low temperature, you will see you know, this non-trivial um, tree structure. And moreover, numerically, the physicists tell us that uh, because it's, it's actually very hard to analyze this. There, there are a lot of interesting results, but you know, the physicists tell you that the overlap distribution will have a continuous component. So the tree will really be, will have infinitely many levels where, where you can merge or at any distance you can merge. Okay, so, but in other models like Edwards Anderson model where nobody really expects to have some kind of analog of the formula for the free energy, you have to find a way, basically, if you want to you know, solve a great problem, you have to find a way to tell whether the distribution of the overlap, can it be trivial or non-trivial in the limit? And that will tell you whether you have phase transition or not. Okay. Now, to conclude, I wanted to um, just mention one class of models where the physicists predict a lot of explicit things where this result is, is very helpful to start you know, working on this, prob on, on this uh, program. And this is the so-called class of diluted models. So an example of diluted model is diluted share inter Kirkpatrick model which is just your comfort function, but not on the complete graph, but on the sparse erdos renyi graph, right? So the coordinates that, the spins that will interact will be chosen, you know, uh, with this um, probability, uh, well, sorry, it should be, P should be like of order one over N, so it should be more like some constant over N, so it should be really a sparse graph, so that, each point is just interacting with some finite neighborhood of points. Okay, that's the diluted version of the SK model. And in this model, the coordinates plus and minus one, they do play a role. Okay? In this Hamiltonian, it's not invariant under orthogonal transformations. It's not enough to describe the distributions of overlaps, but it turns out that uh, you know, in the physics, the Parisi solution is really the basis of some more complicated picture that describes this model. Basically what happens is, first you need to have this ultrametric tree structure that describes how all the distances between the points behave. And once you have that, then they have another layer, another kind of complicated order parameter, which will tell you how the distribution of all individual coordinates behave. Okay, well, you need this, you know, to compute the free energy. And there is also a conjectured explicit formula for the free energy. So in particular, if you can prove, uh, so if you can prove this analog of the Parisi solution with this additional level of difficulty, you will get the explicit formula for the free energy. And just like in the SK model, from that formula, you have hope to read off phase transitions because it's built into the formula 
you, if you figure out how to analyze it, this will tell you whether you have phase transition and so on. So this is a class of models where, you know, until this result that I described, you couldn't really even start working on them because you, you need to have this ultrametric tree structure for the distances before you can say anything else. Okay. And the fact that this result is very soft, you know, you have this perturbation that gives you this ultrametric tree structure automatically, now you can start thinking about, um, you know, all these additional parts of the picture. Okay. And the final thing I want to say, I, you know, I kind of on purpose did not mention any names uh, in my talk because you, you have, if you took the printout, it already has all the references. So if you want to know, you know, all the credit, whom all the credit belongs,